So, you know when some people give a recap and they just share way too much information? Like my friend Leopold, who spent hours last week describing one single game of chess, all his moves, details of how his opponent had a cold and kept sneezing and was definitely cheating, only hours later to tell me that, surprise, surprise, he lost. Bit of a snooze fest. Let's be real. What I want to know are the highlights, who won, who lost, and maybe one or two cool moves. A summary, if you will. And it's not just because I'm lazy, but it's also because when a complicated thing is made clear, it is easier for me to act on that information. Like now I know that Leopold has a new enemy, which means that I have a new enemy. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, a good friend, and this is Study Hall, real world statistics. You don't have to get far into statistics to know that representing a whole bunch of data with just a single value can be super helpful. But when we say that, what we're actually talking about here is averages, which can mean more than one thing. And understanding all the ways we can find averages is key to summarizing our data. To see what these look like, let's go to Suka, a chess fanatic who's putting on a tournament that has become kind of stressful to plan. She has 40 players signed up to take part. These days, they all record their games on a website to study them later and take notes on improving. That same database gives Suka a handy tool for organizing her tournament. One of the first things she looks for are central tendencies, which identify the middle of the shape that data take. Averages, which are a kind of central tendency, take into account all the data and give us a general summary of where the middle is, kind of like the spark notes of data. And Suka really needs some summaries right now. For one thing, she needs to work out the length of time games are expected to take for scheduling purposes. Looking at the website, she can see how long each participant has previously taken during recent games, but Suka wants a single number to help her plan her tournament. So she'll add up the lengths of all of the different games and then divide it by the number of games. That will give her the mean. In general, when people use the word average to refer to a set of numbers, they're referring to the mean. In Suka's case, adding up the lengths of games in her database and dividing them by the number of games by hand would take a long time. But thankfully, she has a pretty simple solution. In most most spreadsheet programs like Google Sheets, calculating an average involves typing the equal sign into an empty cell, followed by average in capital letters and a set of parentheses. Inside the parentheses, you specify the range of cells you want to calculate the mean for. Then press the return key. Using this average operation tells Suga that based on previous games, the average chess game in her tournament will last 90 minutes. But the mean is not always the perfect number that will solve all of your problems. Like if Suga realizes she has room for more participants in her tournament and sets out to attract new chess players that have the same sort of skill level as the current ones. In chess, a player's skill level is broadly reflected by their ELO ranking, which is basically a number that shows how well a player typically does compared to other players. Most existing players in Suka's tournament have scores between 1100 and 1400, and a small number of really good players have rankings higher than 2000. But the average comes to 1423, which is weird. And looking across her list of players, she sees that over 75% of them have a lower ranking than that number. She realizes she has a few players who are significantly better than the rest, which is throwing things off. When all the rankings are added up and divided equally, those really high values skew the entire mean upward. In general, means wind up being a misleading measure of central tendency for highly skewed data. Those are data with a few points that are way above or way below most of the others. So instead, Suka decides to use a median. Medians are a different measure of central tendency that involve ordering all of the points of data from smallest to largest, then simply picking the data point that falls squarely in the middle. If there are two data points in the middle because there's an even number of data points, you take their mean by adding them up and dividing them by two. The great thing about the median is that it's much less sensitive to outliers, so it isn't pulled in either direction by a few extremely high or low values in the data. Going back to Suka's player rankings, all she has to do is change her spreadsheet formula to use the word median in capital letters instead of average in the cell, giving her a median ranking of 1364. By definition, half her players are better or worse than this benchmark, making it a better way to describe the general skill level of players in the tournament. While the mean effectively sums up data and the median captures its halfway point, there are times where neither one is up to the job. 
This is especially true when you're dealing with categorical data, the kind that doesn't involve numbers. For instance, consider Chen, one of the players involved in the tournament. In competitive chess, opening moves are very important, so Chen strategizes in advance of the tournament by preparing to respond to certain possibilities. Reviewing the same database Suka is using, he notices about a dozen overall opening moves players seem to use, with wonderful names like the Sicilian Defense and the English Opening. To make efficient use of his prep time, he wants to focus on the most common type of opening used by other players. Like the mean and median, it's a single value that tells us something important and representative about the data. Statisticians call this the mode. For example, looking at the database of games played by previous players, Chen first creates a frequency table of the opening moves. He can then spot that the Grunfeld defense is the most common opening move, since it has the highest number of counts in the frequency table. In this case, it's actually unlucky that Chen's data consists of text rather than numbers. If his data was numerical, he could have simply used the mode function in a spreadsheet to identify the most common number in a range of cells, just like we saw with the average and median functions. The exact value of the mode, like the most common opening move or the most common number in a piece of data, is often called the modal value. But if two data points are equally matched for the most frequent value, then we say there are bimodal values instead of a unimodal value. Like for instance, if the Nismo Indian defense and the English opening were tied for the most number of opening moves, both of them would be considered the mode. And if there are two or more data points that occur the most often, there would be many modal values, making the data multimodal. For numerical data that might have multiple modes, spreadsheets like Google Sheets also have a function that can identify all the modes in a data set. Even with all of this information, Suka is still missing something important variation. If we think again about how plotted data have a shape, variation tells us how squished up or spread out the data are from the middle. That's important. Knowing how often or how much something varies from a central tendency tells us about the diversity and outcomes we should expect in our data. We can see this in Suka's scheduling problem. While her means tell her that the average game is about 90 minutes, it's not the whole story. Some games will be a little shorter than 90 minutes, while others could be a whole lot longer. Without some way of knowing exactly how much wiggle room to put into the schedule, players might either sit around waiting for ages or be late for the next game. To calculate precisely how much the data vary, whether by a lot or a little, we have what's called a standard deviation. It tells you approximately how far the data are spread out from the mean. A small standard deviation implies that the data occupy a fairly narrow space, while a large standard deviation implies that the distribution is wide. We calculate standard deviation by first taking every single data point and subtracting the mean. This is essentially the distance from each data point to the mean. Then we square all of those distances, which means multiplying each distance by itself. For example, if a specific game took just 70 minutes, we subtract the mean, which is 90, for a distance of negative 20. Negative 20 squared would be negative 20 times negative 20, which is positive 400. Then we add up these squared distances for every data point in our set. That's because some data points are above the mean and some are below it in precisely such a way that the positive and negative distances could all just cancel out. That makes sense. The mean is the center of the shape of our data. So by definition, the average distance away from the average is just zero. But the act of squaring the differences first ensures that every number we add up is positive so that they don't cancel out. Out. Then, as we did for the mean, we divide the whole thing by the number of data points. At this point, we're not finished, but we have calculated a handy statistic called the variance. In short, the variance says how much the data vary about the mean. In spreadsheets, just like we've seen for the other statistical functions, the function name is VAR in all caps, kind of like the thing that they use in soccer to see if you actually scored a goal. The problem with the variance is the units also wind up squared in the process, and 383 minutes squared isn't all that easy for Suka to wrap her head around. That's why we take one final step and take the square root of the variance, and that is the standard deviation. In this case, using the function stdev, which is spreadsheet shorthand for standard deviation, gives Suka a figure of 20. In other words, she can expect that the games will generally be about 20 minutes more or less than the average of 90. With all of this information, Suka's pretty close to finalizing her tournament, but then there's a plot twist. 
she receives an email from a new player, my good friend Leopold, who is interested in joining in the tournament. Leopold's ranking of 1200 falls pretty short of the advertised 1364 ranking, and he wants to know if it would still be worth his time to join in. Suka knows that at least five of her existing players have rankings lower than Leopold's, and realizes that advertising only the median rank glosses over the true variety and skill across players, so she also creates a new flyer that includes a range. In statistics, a range is exactly what it sounds like. It tells you the total range of values that the data span across. In order to calculate it, you simply subtract the minimum value of the data from the maximum value. To identify those values, spreadsheet software contain the functions min and max, which, as usual, you write out in all caps. That gives Suka a maximum of 2100 and a minimum of 1108. Subtracting one from the other gives her a range of just under 1,000. She adds this all to her flyer to indicate the huge skill range of different players. Now both reasonably good and very strong players that might join in are aware that they'll probably find at least a few other competitors in their skill level. Even Leopold. Averages are important in chess, but also everywhere. Think about global warming. Scientists argue that limiting global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming could be the difference between polar bears having enough sea ice to survive and extinction. That 1.5 degrees is an average of all temperatures recorded across the world and across a period of 20 years. And knowing that number helps us plan for a future where we still have polar bears. But when we think about averages, we need to remember to provide context. Combining measures of central tendencies with measures of variation, like standard deviations and ranges, can give us powerful opening moves for overcoming the complexity of data. These moves give us a basic understanding of how to put data in context and anticipate how much things can differ. In other words, they can tell you what to expect and how much to expect the unexpected. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your favorite chess opening move, and smash that subscribe button. Thank you for watching. See you next time.